colleagues and friends, old and new. Uh, my first encounter with the Royal Australian Navy took place 23 years ago in Muscat, Oman, uh, when, the, when the wardrooms of HMAS Success and HMAS uh, Adelaide invited our wardroom over for, a, for an event that was very accurately titled Light Lunch, Heavy Beer. I very much look forward to remembering more of this event than I remember of that one because this is truly an event worth remembering. Now let me turn uh, to immediately to the substance of my presentation. What I've, done is, uh, re what I've done is revisited Ken Booth's book and asked the question, what do navies want when they convene and what do they want when they attend gatherings such as this one? Let me do, let me do in, a, in a, the outset what I advise our students to do when they write papers in Newport for us and give away my punchlines up front. Captain Jones asked me to revisit Ken Booth's book, Navy and For Navies and Foreign Policy, 36 years after that work first appeared. Punchline number one is that the book has weathered well. Much of what Booth says remains strikingly fresh. I want to review some of his concepts here with you and critique a few of them very mildly. Writing something that remains evergreen is no small thing in the world of naval and military affairs, where, as you know, we tend to obsess over the day's headlines, over the minutia of administration hardware and tactics, and even at times on individual personalities. How did the author accomplish all of this? Well, he accomplished it by refusing to dwell on the events of his day, which would have anchored his book in the late Cold War and given it a rather musty smell by now. He was all about helping us think and he cared little about prescribing specific policies. This is something that endears the book to me, which is why I superimposed a second purpose on my assignment for this conference, using navies and foreign policy as an eyepiece through which to survey the purposes beyond the, behind, behind and beyond the international camaraderie and cooperation that form the public face of this gathering. There's more to such occasions than that. Consider a historical case that relates directly to the RAN's entry into Sydney in 1913. In 1908, five years before that, the U.S. Navy's Great White Fleet dropped anchor here during its round-the-world cruise. I started off my academic career writing about Theodore Roosevelt's handling of naval diplomacy. The Battle Fleet's world cruise was a goodwill gesture towards foreign nations, and it made good PR at home. And that, and that was a deliberate thing. In his memoir, President Roosevelt said he wanted the voyage to be a striking thing that would consolidate and reinforce America's maritime culture. Roosevelt wanted to renew the love affair of ordinary people with the sea and with their navy. This was an act of cultural upkeep for a continent-spanning nation that had the option and naval proponents feared the preference of looking inward to continental affairs. Over the past few days, we have heard echoes of this sort of thinking from our Australian hosts, and for good reason, given the resemblance between Australian and North American ge geography and strategic circumstances. Culture takes care and feeding. But Roosevelt also acknowledged that he had ulterior motives for dispatching the fleet. He wanted to show Imperial Japan that it should stood no chance of doing to the U.S. Pacific Fleet what it had done to the Russian Baltic Fleet, not long before, namely thrash a fleet that was debilitated from a long voyage into East Asian waters. TR believed the Great White Fleet could deter Japan by steaming across the Pacific and arriving in the Far East in fighting trim. The cruise thus was a display of capability and resolve, as well as a venture meant to inspire and conciliate. Thus it was 105 years ago, and thus it remains today. Fleet reviews, I submit, are about branding and messaging. We try to impress our constituents, our allies, our potential adversaries, and fence sitters who might become allies or adversaries depending on how well we play our cards. And we try to send messages of reassurance, coercion, or deterrence to various audiences. Fleet reviews are about diplomacy, and diplomacy, in turn, is about persuasion and dissuasion. That's what diplomats do negotiate with foreign governments on behalf of their nations using all the tools in the policy toolkit. Let's not avert our eyes from the reality that we all have national self-interest to pursue here. That's punchline number two. Let's be candid about our purposes, not only how they coincide, but also how they differ. Admittedly, I'm striking a rather dour note on such an upbeat occasion. Let me explain briefly why I sound such a note. I organized my paper around Booth's naval trinity of military, constabulary, and diplomatic functions. Now, the trinity is not a perfect metaphor. No metaphor is. 
depicting the three roles played by navies as three sides of an equilateral, excuse me, an equilateral triangle, as Booth does, conflates diplomacy with the instruments of diplomacy. The military and police functions are mainly about capability, meaning skilled, motivated crews, handling ships, aircraft, and weaponry adequate to their missions. The diplomatic function is about putting capability to political use. Therefore, it misleads to, to equate policy with the implements used to, to accomplish policy goals. With that caveat, however, the Naval Trinity remains a serviceable model for evaluating this international fleet review. Let's take the military domain first. Ken Booth tells us, rightly, that the capacity to use force is the bedrock on which all else navies do is founded. How can we advance our military prowess by assembling here? First, fleet reviews help us know ourselves and know others. The Chinese General Sun Tzu depicts foreknowledge as the beginning of strategic wisdom. I hardly need to tell you how greatly navies vary in size, types of platforms, and roles in missions. We can acquaint ourselves firsthand with how other navies are configured, see the world, and conduct business. Such cultural familiarity is the basis for cooperative or competitive endeavors. Second, we can take each other's measure in material terms. Visiting foreign ships offers a rare chance to peek inside the black boxes that are naval hardware in peacetime, when combat performance remains largely a matter of conjecture for outsiders. Indicators as simple as rust or slovenly housekeeping can speak volumes about professionalism, about how well a crew will execute when it matters. Conversely, by presenting ourselves smartly, we can impress others who come aboard our vessels. And thirdly, Multinational exercises are often held in conjunction with fleet reviews, as indeed Triton Centenary brackets this week's festivities. Sharing tactics, techniques, and procedures through realistic maneuvers puts joint and combined capability in place so that it exists when it's needed. Police functions can get entangled with power politics, giving rise to truly wicked diplomatic problems. What happens when one coastal state patrols waters claimed by another? and backs up its Coast Guard with naval firepower should the rival claimant challenge it. Such a clash is far from hypothetical. Just look to our north where the China Coast Guard is policing di disputed waters in the South and East China Seas while the PLA Navy and land-based weaponry provide backup from over the horizon. Under such circumstances, it's impossible to separate police from military endeav endeavors quite as neatly as Booth implies that we can. Events such as this fleet review offer, offer an opportunity to exchange views about such topics frankly. We may not agree with one another, we may not head off competition or even conflict, but at least we can help assure that any friction results not from misunderstanding but from conscious choice. That's no small contribution that we can make here. Here it's worth recalling Booth's observation that the dual nature of warships complicates constabulary work. That is, high-end combatants can execute combat or police functions. Indeed, the only real difference between a capital ship patrolling the sea and a capital ship deterring or coercing a rival state is in the mind of the policymaker who's giving the orders. A vessel performing counter-piracy or counter-proliferation duty can morph into a combat ship and back again as though a switch has been thrown. Think about USS Bainbridge, one of the world's premier surface combatants, taking down hijackers on board the Maersk, Alabama, four years ago. This dual nature makes it both important and hard for great navies, such as my own, to explain their purposes to, to coastal states that are suspicious that we're using police endeavors as an excuse to prepare to fight in their backyards. Assigning Coast Guard-like ships to Coast Guard-like missions is one possible way to work around such misgivings. Again, this gathering offers an opportunity to clarify our intentions on such matters and discuss options. And finally, how about the diplomatic function? Booth sees negotiating from a position of strength, shaping international relationships of various kinds, and accumulating prestige as three main functions navies perform in the diplomatic realm. Diplomacy is about communicating, and communicating effectively demands capability, military and constabulary capability in this case. You have to have a big stick or a nightstick to back up what you say. But molding perceptions among disparate audiences re represents a squishier task than amassing hardware or human capacity. How do we accomplish that? Let me supp supplement Booth's analysis here with a formula from Henry Kissinger to help us think this through. Kissinger describes deterrence as a product of capability, resolve, 
and the opponent's belief in our capability and resolve. We issue a threat, display the capacity to make good on that threat, and convince the adversary that we mean what we say and that our equipment can do what we say it will. Because deterrence is a product of multiplication, deterrence is zero if any one of these factors goes to zero. The audience gets a say in this two-way interactive process. The same can be said of coercion, in which we try to get an unwilling opponent to, do, to take some positive action rather than desist from doing something we oppose. The same goes for reassurance, in which we make a promise to some ally, friend, or neutral. Clear, convincing communication is at a premium, whoever the audience may be. How is naval diplomacy playing out here in Sydney? Let me close by speculating about our host's motives, and then let, me, then let me be parochial for a minute and speculate about American motives. You could run the same analysis for the other navies represented here, but then we would be here until the cows come home. What do Australians want? Like the rest of us, the RAN doubtless wants to reaffirm its reputation for excellence in seamanship, tactics, and hardware. This fleet review thus represents upkeep for, our, for Australia's martial reputation. The naval establishment wants this occasion to be a striking thing, to recall TR's words from 105 years ago. That, I would say, is the easy part. The diplomatic challenge is trickier. Canberra wants to consolidate its standing within the US-Australia alliance, reach out to fellow seafaring Asian states such as Japan and India, and do all of this while reassuring China that it is not a foe in the making. The task before Canberra is to display strength, to tend to alliance maintenance, and to deter while conciliating. That's an ambitious diplomatic agenda. Yet these competing requirements should prove manageable so long as competitive impulses in the region remain mostly in check. How about my own country? Strangely, I think the US Navy, the senior partner in the Trans-Pacific Alliance system, has the most to prove, both here at Sydney and in general. The United States must prove that it can still execute both military and police functions, that it can do so despite the tyranny of distance in the Pacific, and that it can do so despite the anti-access measures deployed by the likes of the PLA and the Iranian Armed Forces. This is a tough road to hoe, as we say in the hills of Tennessee. Showing Asian allies, prospective allies and partners, and prospective opponents that Washington keep, can keep its commitments and fulfill its threats in distant waters is central to U.S. maritime strategy. This forms an undercurrent to this international fleet review. Navies and foreign policy could have served as the American playbook here at Sydney. I hope it did. In closing, however, let me, let me say a quick word taking issue with something that Booth says, and this relates to many of the fleets represented here, namely that naval diplomacy is a preserve of great powers. Far from it. Savvy diplomacy is more crucial for smaller navies, which, after all, cannot afford to throw money and resources at problems. And in this era of declining force structures and fiscal stringency, smaller navies carry more weight relative to the great powers than they have in the past. This is worth remembering during our interactions here this week. So let's be candid with one another about all of these things, not just about our desire to coexist and cooperate, but about the differences that could bring about a darker future and about all of our Navy's capacity to make a difference as we venture into that future. Ken Booth supplies few answers to the many questions that he raises about naval diplomacy, nor can I. But like any good professor, he helps us ask the right questions. So my verdict on navies and foreign policy 30 years on is mission accomplished. Thank you.